Mr. Collar. There you go. There you go. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to be going through four giants that I think the church needs to defeat tonight as we've been going through uh, 2 Samuel 19 through 21. And so um, I, I highlighted those four things on Facebook for everyone to kind of look at. Does anybody know or remember what those four things are? Some of you may not have saw it. It's okay. The first one was marriage. The second one was um, to make it just one word, abortion. The third one was racism. And the fourth one was compromise. Those are the four giants that I think the church needs to defeat in order for us to be victorious in what God's called us to do. And so we're just kind of going to go through these four things. I'm not going to be able to discuss all of them in great detail. So we're going to give you some scriptures and you're going to be able to just kind of take it and, and kind of do your own study with it. Um, so, so we're going to jump into that and go forward from there. The first one is marriage. Um, we see early on in Genesis chapter 2 that uh, marriage is created. And it talks about the, 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 the man leaving his mother and father and him and his wife becoming one. We see that starting there. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Uh, and anybody here is watching can be feel free to type on the answer as well. But why is marriage so important? Anybody uh, quietly want to give me the answer so nobody hears your answer in case it's wrong? I know somebody's a little hesitant. It's an order of God. Right? It certainly was an order of God. Uh, I think marriage is important, and I think the, the, the best example of why it's important is because it's built on the model of Christ and His church. You see, it certainly elevates marriage to a higher level when it's connected to the relationship between Jesus and the church. Now, let's examine the relationship between Jesus and the church, because I think it tells us a lot about how God views marriage and how God wants marriage to be. Um, what we see in the relationship between Christ and the church is an enduring love. Certainly on, the, on behalf of Christ. Christ loved the church. He laid down his life for the church. No man took it from him, but he laid it down. He is at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the church. One day he's coming back to return to take the church with him. So we see an enduring love there between Christ and the church. And so there are certain scriptures that we can look at and that can give us an example of certain things. Ephesians chapter 5 is a great chapter when it talks about um, how marriage should be. And I encourage you to read that and study that in its context. And chapter, or verses 21 through 31 are a great example of that. Same way in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6. But we're just, not just going to talk about marriage tonight. But I think the biggest issue that the church is dealing with is the sanctity of marriage. And so uh, the reality is, is that these things happen. Things like divorce happen. And there are many folks that have, that have been through a divorce and have dealt with a divorce. And it's a difficult time. And it isn't something that anybody really, I'm sure, would enjoy or say was pleasurable uh, any way, shape, or form. Maybe they might have a different opinion now. But I think everyone would agree that it's just not necessarily an easy thing. And so not only is something that happens in our life, but is divorce in the Bible? Yes, right? It's in the Bible. Moses said that. Uh, if somebody wants to divorce their spouse, they need to give them a written form of divorce. So Moses put that in order. And there are other places in Scripture where we see that taking place. But I think that's not the most important question for us tonight. The most important question for us is to remember this. Is God pleased with divorce? I think that's the bigger question. And I think what we would have to say resoundingly is no. He's not pleased with it. It happens, and no one enjoys it. And it isn't something that anyone brags about, and certainly not a believer brags about. It isn't something that anybody uh, is condemned for in terms of the eyes of the church because we're all broken people trying to worship the Lord and live for Him. But it is something that God is not pleased with. And so it's just the reality of that. Uh, we see in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, God says his famous words that He hates what? Divorce. He hates it. He hates it. Now, some would say that 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is a chapter that brings great hope and great uh, comfort to those that are going through difficulties in marriage and going through difficulties in relationship. And I would encourage you to read that, but I would encourage you to read it in context. How important is it to read the Bible in context? It's very important, right? What we find, and this is, I believe this is systemic through the entirety of the church with a lot of issues. Instead of us allowing the Bible to lead us and guide us, we kind of just pull things out of the Bible that we want that either justify or kind of give us comfort 
for what we're going through. And a lot of times the same things happen with issues like this where uh, we may read a portion of Scripture that says one thing and go, man, you know, that gives me comfort because I read this. But the danger with that is, is that we don't give ourselves the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to lead us through the Bible and the truth of God's Word because the entire Bible is true. We believe that, right? The entire Bible is true. Everything in it is true. It's the inspired Word of God. So what I would encourage everyone to do and what I think God would have us to do is to not read the Bible like you're going to a buffet. How many of you have been to a buffet before? We've all been to a buffet, right? Um, I know you have. You can't. Don't lie to me. Uh, we've all been there. So when we go, there are certain things that we like. Now, some of you are pretty, pretty general in what you like, and you kind of take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But for some of us, we go and we get certain things. Like if I go to the buffet and you see me go to the buffets, let's just, for example, say a Chinese buffet. There are certain things that I'm going to get. General, general sows, right? You've got to get some of that. The pork fried rice, you got to get some of that. The, the chicken on a stick, teriyaki chicken, if that's there, you got to get some of that. Not all buffets have uh, the peanut chicken, but you got to get some of that, right? When you, so uh, if they have crab ragoon, you got to get some of that, right? But, you know, I don't really go crazy with any of the other stuff. I just kind of stick with what works, and I'll come back and get certain things, and, and it works for me, right? But I don't really get the entire feel of what the buffet has. I mean, sometimes they have sushi. I know... Pastor Chris and I went to the one place, Ukai, I think it's buffet, and they've got sushi and different things there, and that's pretty good. And some places will have like little Mongolian barbecue where you can fry stuff up, and that's nice too. But I just rather stick with stick with the simple stuff, and so I just I don't I don't deviate. And I think sometimes folks read the Bible that way. They go, you know what? I know this scripture. I like this scripture, so I'm going to hold on to that scripture. I like that scripture. I'm going to hold on to that scripture. I like that scripture. I'm going to hold on to that scripture. In doing so, though, we don't give ourselves the ability to really understand the Bible in its proper context. And that makes all the difference. It makes all the difference in the world when we study the Bible. And the danger with us doing that is that in our, in our flesh, we can kind of blo- block things out because we just don't want to... To accept them. And the danger with that is, is that if we don't accept the Bible in its entirety, then I don't think we can accept the Bible at all. Does that make sense? Because the Bible was canonized and it was everything that's in the Bible has been inspired by God. There was a process that went forth that, that canonized the scripture and all of the writings that may have been from historical people or even people in the Bible are not in here because they don't meet that standard that was set for the Bible. So everything in here harmonizes and everything in here is united by the Spirit of God. The writers were inspired to write it. And so if we reject portions of the Bible because we just don't like what they say or don't like what it says, then we have to reject everything. Does that make sense? I think it might be difficult for some to believe that and accept that. But the reality is that if we don't accept it all, I'm not sure that we can accept any of it. Because in order to accept it and to believe something, according to what the Bible says, you have to what? Build your life on it. And if I'm building my life on God's Word, then I need to let God's Word lead me in how I read it. So when we read things, when it comes to marriage, the danger that we have is we cannot let society influence us more than God's Word. God's Word has to be uh, our, our source for truth. It has to be our source for everything. And so everything in the Bible must be read in context. Although seemingly provisions are made in Scripture for certain things, and certainly there are provisions made uh, by Moses in the Old Testament and in 1 Corinthians 7 uh, for different factors, but we have to understand the true fact of the nature is, is that God hates it when relationships are broken. God hates it when marriages are broken. He hates it when people on both sides of the party are hurt because it's not the way he intended it to be. He didn't intend it to be that way, and so it becomes a problem when those things aren't happening. And so I will say this, and this may not be a popular statement for some, there are many factors in what, that, that, are, that cause why people don't um, work it out and things happen in relationships, but what I'm finding, sadly, so often now in the church is it just, become, just comes down to people just being too prideful to humble themselves and work things out. And that's sad. That, that's certainly not what it's supposed to be. You know, there are, certain, there are certain things that happen that nobody knows and things that nobody can certainly try to, uh, you know, understand. But the last thing that we need to do as a church is to become complicit in a society that has made everything disposable. Are you with me? 
everything is disposable. Nothing really is uh, sanctified. Nothing is holy. Nothing really has any reverence to it. And the very thing that happened in the beginning of the Bible was marriage. And as a result of that, everything's been built on that model. And now we're seeing this rapid decay, even inside the church of people uh, that look at things differently. So it's something we need to fight against as a church. We need to pray, God, let me honor you in my life. Let me honor you in my marriage. Let me honor you uh, amongst everyone around me so that they can, they can see um, you, not me. So the second one is <clears throat> sanctity of life. Anybody want to take a guess how many people are aborted or have been aborted right now in America this year already? Yep. You'd be, you'd be astonished. Over 9 million. Just in 2016 alone. And it's Right. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. So, anybody want to take a guess how many babies have been killed since Roe v. Wade was brought forth? Passed? Over 50 million. You know how many people have been killed in all the wars? Maybe two million. You know how many how many Jews were killed in the Holocaust? Yeah. You put all put those two together, what's that equal up to? About eight million. So how many were killed in America since nineteen seventy two, I think it is seven in the seventh? Over fifty million. That's crazy. It's crazy. Now, I'm going back to my point I said in the beginning. The danger that we have, we have in, in, in the church is we begin to let society dictate to us what is norm instead of us being the ones that present and project the way someone should live and how someone should live. It's a terrible thing. Now, why do you think so much or so many abortions are happening now? <clears throat> I'm going to tell you what I think. And I think I can make a good case against it, although some would probably try to uh, defend uh, certain things. I think, sadly, the majority of it comes down to convenience. It, we live in such a disposable society now. And society has convinced us that children are not living until a certain point. And so there's no personal connection with anyone when, when they go through this. And people just have no consequences, and, and so they kind of just live and do whatever they want, and it's a tough thing. <clears throat> now, many of us know someone that's probably a pro-choice person. There are a number of Christians that are pro-choice, believe it or not, that believe that, that, that someone should have the right to, to whether or not they're going to have an abortion or not. Um, but I think the one simple question that I have a hard time with, and I think most people that are pro-choice that are Christians have a hard time with, is what about the baby? Right? What does the baby think? What does the baby want? Now some would say that they're not a living creature. But I think we're under a slippery slope when we start to uh, say that there's bacteria on Mars. And we say that that's living. But then there's something growing inside of a mother's womb. And doctors say that that's not a living being. It's crazy. But this is the danger, guys. Once we reject the sanctity of human life, then all bets are off. Once life has no sanctity, once life has, there's nothing sacred about life, then that changes the way we view everyone. It changes the way we view our neighbor. It changes the way we view um, women. And the reality is, is in our world today, um, probably boys and young girls, but mostly young girls, are victims of the repercussions of the sanctity of life just not being there. That they don't feel like that anybody... Their life is special, that their life has meaning, and so they just use them as property. And we've seen that all over the world, and it's really existed uh, for thousands of years in humankind. But once we get to that point, there's really no limit to our depravity. Once we get to the point where life is not sacred, then there's no limit to where we can stoop. But what does the Bible say? Well, the Bible doesn't talk about abortion but it says enough about what God thinks and what God does inside of the womb of a woman to make every Christian, should make every Christian believe that God has a dynamic, supernatural role inside of the womb 
and it ought to be treated as such. First, uh, or Jeremiah 1.5 tells us that God knows us before He forms us in His womb. Psalm 139 is a popular portion of Scripture that talks about us being fearfully and wonderfully made, right? Psalm 139, 13 through 16. Did you know in Exodus 21 that it actually says that someone who uh, causes the death of a baby in the mother's womb is to be considered the same as someone who commits a murder? Now that's tough. So I'm going to challenge all Christians with that notion. All of those scriptures indicate what to me? That God says that a baby is important in a mother's womb. And so what we got to be careful of is that we don't allow ourselves to be complicit in saying, well, it's not our, it's her, it's her choice. She does what she wants. I think in order for us to live that way, then we have to, there's a couple of things that have to happen. And this is the dangerous part. If somebody wants to believe that they have a choice in whether or not they live certain ways and do certain things in life, they have to reject God's sovereignty in their life. They have to reject the sovereignty of the word in their life. And the, the sad truth is, as many people get away with those things because they don't live under God's conviction. They don't live under the authority of God. See, Christians that live under conviction, it's difficult for them to believe certain things and be straight away by certain things because they... They have a standard that they're living by, a standard that they're going by. And so it's a terrible thing. <clears throat> so for the Christian, abortion is not a matter of a woman's right to choose. It's a matter of life or death of a human being <clears throat> that God has made. And that's a difficult thing. But it's something we need to be challenged with tonight. This is definitely going to challenge everyone. <clears throat> Thirdly, racism. You guys think racism still exists in our world? Yes. I definitely think it does. Why? We've come so far. Why does it still exist? Fear. I think. Yeah. Would you guys be surprised if I told you that the church in the last hundred years is pretty complicit? in the division that exists in our nation. It's sad, but it's true. Um, let me give you an example. <clears throat> Anybody ever heard of the Church of God in Christ? It's actually the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world. They have over 10,000 churches. I don't know that they're the largest in number of people. I think the Assemblies of God is larger in people. But did you know that the Assemblies of God and the Church of God in Christ used to be the same, used to be one denomination? It was a massive denomination. And they split in the 60s. You know why they split? Civil rights. So the Church of God in Christ was predominantly all the African American members. And the Assemblies of God became predominantly all of the Caucasian and non-African American population. And even to this day, there exists a divide. Now, both leaders are trying to work out Situations to try to bring unity. But wheels have been set in motion in the church culture that is very, very divided. It's very difficult to walk into many churches, even churches in most affluent areas, and see diversity. And that's on both sides of the, of the, of the spectrum. But I want you to know that that's not something that God is happy with. God isn't happy with the lack of, of diversity in, in his church. Because all of us are equal. And all of us have been created in God's image. Now this may challenge some. Because I think for some we've grown up believing that someone's different because of the color of their skin. Right? That someone's less than us because of the color of their skin. Or because of where they come from. Or because of the language they speak. Or because of the, the, the amount of education they have. <clears throat> and it's a cultural thing. But the danger is, yet again, when the church allows the culture to dictate to them what is right, we get ourselves in a difficult situation. So let me challenge you with a couple of things. <clears throat> Does God show partiality? He hates it. So he doesn't show partiality, so should we. No. 
we shouldn't show anyone partiality. In fact, the Bible says that, that Jesus commands us to love one another as he loves us. And so we're supposed to love one another as Christ loved us. But racism still exists in our world. And if the church is going to be the church of Jesus Christ, and if the church is going to be this beacon of light and hope, and going to be this place where people can come and they can hear the truth and love of God, we've got to stop being complicit in that. You know what that means? We've got to eradicate from us all of the wicked, sinful language that we've allowed to creep into our lives. I'm serious. That might mean some of the jokes that we say, we don't need to talk about them anymore. Some of the way that we view other people, we can't do that anymore. No one can see who raises their hands but me. But I know many of us can probably be honest with this, and I'll be, I'll be right with you and say that I've judged someone based on what they look like. That I've made an assumption of someone based on where they come from. And sadly, it's, it's something that's tough because uh, our, the cultures are becoming so polarizing where someone that grows up in this particular culture, they typically always are going to act this way and going to be this way. And it's difficult because when you, when you mix different cultures, there definitely is trouble. And so I would encourage you to, to, to really be sensitive of that when you get into a relationship with someone, that your cultures are going to be able to, to work together and not create more, more harm. But let's be clear about it. God doesn't think of one culture or one uh, level of pigmentation or the lack thereof of someone and think, well, they're, 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 they're much higher on the pecking order. This is what I think. And I know that there are different scientific definitions for certain things. But I think in order for us to be Christians, we have to understand that there is only one race. You know what that is? The human race. The human race. That I don't judge somebody based on the fact that they have a darker complexion than me or because they come from a different part of the town than me or they come from a different part of the country than me. I judge them on the basis the way Christ judges them. And I love them on the basis the way that Christ loves them. So it's important for us to understand that whether it's Caucasians, Africans, Asians, Latinos, Indians, Arabs, or Jews. There's no difference in God's eyes. You know what he said in Galatians? He says that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So why do we allow society to divide us so much? You think we kind of play, play into that as well? I think we play into it. You think churches can be racist? Yes, very much so. Right? Some of the darkest times in the history of America have come out of uh, pulpits and people saying things that have created the most heinous and despicable uh, acts imaginable. And the sad reality is, is that we've got to break that. And if we don't break that, then we're, we're going to be complicit in that. So what am I challenging with? I'm challenging you to go out of your way to treat someone the way that God would treat them. To go out of your way to love someone the way that God would love them. To not allow yourself to be consumed with uh, the hate that so easily gets crept up inside of us. You know, we can lose our lunch over differences in the Bible. You know that? I mean, Christians can get into fights over doctrinal differences. We, we, if, if we don't control this, we can truly become so overwhelmed with either, either you're with us or you're against us that we can, we can be ruined. And I will say this, that when we get to heaven... I'm going to say something's going to challenge you guys. When we get to heaven, you know, there isn't going to be a Baptist section and a Pentecostal section. There isn't going to be a Lutheran section. Pastor Michael, there's not even going to be a special spot for the Jews. <laughs> as much as we talk about Israel and how we're supposed to protect and honor Israel, you know what? In God's eyes, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, Catholic, do you think there's going to be different spots in heaven for those people? No. It's not going to be a different spot. If somebody accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior and believes that He died on the cross for them, you know what the Bible says? They'll be saved. Does it say anything else? When He created Adam and Eve, does it say that He created them 
and they were, uh, you know, they were separate from all these other groups. No, we can trace the Bible back to a lot of different um, things and see where connections take place in terms of the diversity of, of, of people and the way we, we, we look and things like that. But all of them are created by God. If you believe that everyone in the womb is created by God, it doesn't matter the color of their skin. Make sense? Now I'm going to challenge you with something. I'm going to pray before we leave tonight that God would remind you of all the times that you will make a racial statement and not realize it. Because I think all of us do it. Sometimes we don't even realize it. We may not say it, but sometimes we think it. And it's difficult because of where we live. I went up north and lived in Ohio for three years, and there's certainly a fair share of hatred and racism all over the, the world. But when I came back home and I was interacting with, with family and different folks, I realized, my goodness, there's still a lot of racism in our world, particularly in this area. And I think sometimes we fight so hard for certain things and we miss the point. It doesn't matter what the color of our skin is. It doesn't matter where we come from. What matters is, is that the Lord loves us. And so we've got to stop racism. Fourth thing is compromise. What do you think people do to compromise in churches? I think we compromise in two different ways. I think we compromise when we fail to accept the word. You see, when we hear the Bible and we hear the word, we have to either accept it or what? Reject it. And sometimes by us not allowing the Bible to lead us, what I mean by that is, is not just opening the Bible to find certain things in it that we know that are going to make us feel good. Because it's natural. When I read something in the Bible that makes me feel good, you know what? I will memorize it. I will recite it to myself because it makes me feel good. But when I read something in the Bible that doesn't make me feel good, I wish I never read it. Because it invokes a response. Either I have to accept it and then i got to change or I have to reject it. And if I reject it, then I'm rejecting everything in the Bible. Because I can't just say, well, I'm going to, I reject this, but this I like. There are so many Christians that build their theology that way. Well, I don't accept everything in the Bible, but I do like this. So I'm going to build my life on that. We compromise. And when we compromise, we uh, discredit the power and authority of God's word. We discredit uh, God's place and authority in our lives. And we've got to be careful that we don't do that. There's a portion of scripture I want to read with you. It's uh, Psalms 119, and it's 1 through 8. And it, it really plays into to what we're saying here. It says, Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil, and they walk only in his paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. All that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. As I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your decrees. Please don't give up on me. If there was ever a prayer that I pray for the churches, God, don't give up on us. We're, we're a broken bunch of people. The fact that we can look at these four things and say that these four things are attacking the church and these four things have got to be dealt with in the church or else we're going to have big problems coming forward just shows to the level the fact that we have uh, just messed everything up. We've just messed it up. And so my prayer is, God, don't give up on us. Don't give up on us. And hopefully one day our eyes will be open and we'll see the truth. But when people fail to accept the word, they compromise the message of Jesus Christ. We see that in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. Secondly, we compromise the word of God when we place our desires and that of others ahead of the word of God. Have you ever been tempted, I know many of us have, I know I have as a pastor, to water down what the Bible says because I'm afraid of what somebody's going to think? You ever been there? Well, the danger is, is that when we kind of just devote our whole life by picking things out of the Bible and saying certain things, then we can definitely get ourselves in trouble by saying, well, I'm only saying this because I know this person's going through this. But I don't preach that way. I read the Bible and I have a list of scriptures and I have a certain set of scriptures that I try to preach out of so that if I ever say anything that somebody says that offended me, Pastor, I can honestly say and lay my head down tonight and Selena can confirm it. I go, 
I didn't pick that out because I, I knew anything that you were going through. I just let I'm just reading. I'm preaching the Bible. And so what do we do on Tuesday nights? I didn't write 2 Samuel 19 through 21. I didn't write any of the books of the Bible. So we just go through these books, and I can't tell you how many times that we've read something that is related to what's going on in our country, related to what's going on in our world, and it just shows that the Bible is living and active. And if you let the Bible lead you, then you will see the truth. And so we can't just be afraid uh, to live by the Bible. And there are still some that are going to say, I had someone that left the church um, because they said that I was picking on them for something that uh, they were doing. And... And those that were in the situation knew that I'd wrote this message three weeks ago. I didn't even know this was going on at the time. I didn't even know this person was even going to be at the church. They didn't actually go to the church, but they came and visited. They were family members. And they came and they got so upset at me because they said that I was preaching right at them. And I wasn't because I didn't even know they were going to be there. Because the Spirit of God is living and active and He can speak to our hearts. And that's why it's so important for us not to... Pick and choose what we agree with and pick and choose what we teach in the Bible because it compromises the authority of God's word. If we teach it and preach it the way it needs to be preached, then it might offend some, but I hope it does. Because if our hearts are offended, then we'll change. And if we don't, then we'll reject it. But right now, I think we have so many people that are kind of like, eh, I'm okay with whatever. You know? The word of God will condemn those that are doing wrong. Yes. So you preach the word of God. So that means our methods have got to change a little bit. We can't just read the Bible for what we want to get out of it. We've got to read the Bible for what God wants us to see in it. Make sense? And if we do that, then that changes everything. It'll change the way that we, that we live. It'll change the way that we view life. It'll change the way that we view marriage. It'll change the way that we view everything. Other people. Our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so it's important for us to attack these four giants. And if we don't do that, I'm afraid that we're going to get ourselves in trouble. But if we are able to get victory in these areas and to be the ones that teach and preach and show the words of truth and be the examples that we're supposed to be, then I really believe that we'll see the reward that God wants to, to receive. People will be saved. Lives will be changed. People will come to know the Lord. And we might think that it's not going to happen because the world seems to be going quickly in the other direction, doesn't it? It's quickly going in the other direction. So the... The, the nature of us is to go, well, we got we to find somewhere in the middle to kind of burrow down in. If we do anything to compromise the word of God, then we're in error. And we're going to stand in judgment for it. So we preach the word of God, regardless of whether or not the culture changes, regardless of whether or not society shifts and changes. We know that God's word doesn't change. And it was just as relevant when it was written in the first century as it is now, as we just talked about. Make sense? Are you with me? Yes. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you minister to us tonight. I pray that our hearts would be challenged, Lord, to live for you. I pray that we would look to you and we would look to your word as the author and perfecter of our faith. That we would let your word be a light into our path. That we would hide it in our hearts. That your word says that we would not sin against you. Lord, I pray that we would trust you. That we would put our faith in you. That it wouldn't just be out of fear uh, where we don't live according to your word, God. But we would have the faith to stand on your word. Because what I believe that you have the answers to life. And that your word is life to us. And it brings life to us, God. It opens our eyes to see your word. And so, Father, we pray we be encouraged tonight, Lord. This message wasn't to discourage anyone. But this message was to encourage us all to live for you. To encourage us to, to look to you and let you be our our leader and our guide, to let the spirit of truth guide us into all truth. And so, Father, I pray as we're dismissed that we would let the Holy Spirit come inside of us and the Holy Spirit would just open our eyes and illuminate your word to us and that we'd be challenged in how we live, God. We just ask this in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for being with us. Thank you all for being with us tonight. We pray God blesses you. Amen.